We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church family. Great to see you all gathered together for worship. I, um, I'm excited we're about six weeks into a seven-week series called The Wander Years and today is the moment we're actually gonna get to the wandering part of the wander years. Believe it or not, there's this, this, uh, the, this whole time, right, we've been kind of walking up through this moment, and we're gonna get to the place where the wandering actually begins today at week six out of seven. Before we do, we're gonna talk about some spies today. So I wanted to tell you a little joke I heard recently about spies. You guys got a second? You're not going anywhere, right? All right, um, so, uh, there's this guy, right, and he gets arrested by, by our national uh, intelligence, one of the agencies, one of the you know, three-letter agencies, and they're sitting there and they're talking to him, and they say, listen, we know that you are a Russian spy, and that's why you've been arrested. And the guy says, what are you talking about? I've, I, I, I've been in this country my whole life, and I'm not a Russian spy. And they're like, no, 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 we know you're a Russian spy. He's like, what are you talking about? I can't, I, I'm not. He's like, I, I, I know. I, I can name all 50 states. They're like, no, 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 we know you're, you're a Russian spy. I can name all the capitals. No, nah, nice try. I can tell you all the lyrics to the national anthem. Nice try. I can tell you all 46 presidents in order. He's like, no, we know that you're a Russian spy. And he's like, I give up. How did you figure it out? He's like, Americans don't know any of those things. <laughs> anyway, hey, uh, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and uh, it's just an honor to, to have you here as we open up God's Word like we do every week, and we, we ultimately look and see what does God want us to know about who He is, what is He revealing about Himself, and how can we take those truths and apply them to our own lives. So if this is one of your first Sundays here with us, I want you to know we're really glad you're here. Everyone uh, kn knows that you belong here. Everyone here belongs here. If you believe like we do, or you're still trying to figure things out, you're, we're really glad that you're in this place this morning. Uh, so we're going to uh, kind of go, like I said, uh, further into our, our Wander Year series. And like I said, no wandering has actually happened yet. So we're going to get to the place today where the wandering starts. Up to this point, right, we've worked all the way through, through Exodus. We've seen the people leave Egypt. We've seen them kind of go into uh, receiving of God's law, and we've seen a whole bunch of rebelling and a whole bunch of mercy on God's part. And then we see to the place where they actually, God uh, decides he's going to move in with his people. We talked last week about the concept of the tabernacle, of God dwelling with us. And that's kind of leads us all the way we got through Exodus 30. And if you really kind of, as we move into the book of Leviticus, I'm going to give you a real quick over, overview of what Leviticus is. Remember, as God's people received word from God that he now wants to tabernacle with them, that they're now going to live together you think about what happens when you have a new roommate. How many of you have before have had a, a moment where you, you were moving in with someone kind of for the first time? Maybe it was in college, a dorm mate, or maybe you were renting a place and you found a roommate, or maybe you just, you know, you're newlyweds and you're kind of figuring out how to, to do life living together. Well, essentially, right, you're going to find that you have to establish what are called house rules. Here's some rules we're going to live by. Hey, if you use a dish... Don't just put it in the sink, right? Clean it and put it away. Hey, you vacuum, I'll take out the trash. You do that, you do that, right? You kind of establish some rules that everyone's gonna live by. Well, what Leviticus is, essentially, remember God has said, I'm going to build, or here's the instructions to build this tabernacle and I'm now gonna dwell with you. And then the book of Leviticus is essentially, you ready for this? It's the house rules. Here's how we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to now live together, and these are the rules we are going to live by. Now, what's a little bit unfair here is that it's God's house, and therefore, he sets all the rules. 
These are the rules. This is how we're going to live together. This is how I'm going to dwell amongst my people. And as you go through Leviticus, you get some details about those house rules. Uh, they, there's rituals, rules for the priests, how to stay pure. There's uh, directions for the Day of Atonement. But essentially, I've just given you a very quick summary of what Leviticus is, the rules at which we're going to live together by. And then once you get past Leviticus, essentially, right? So now there's this tabernacle. God's people are out of Egypt. There, He's now dwelling with them. The rules of the, the, the tabernacle are established. And we get to the book of Numbers, Now, the reason why Numbers is called Numbers is that at two places within the book, there's a census where you get to find out the numbers of how many people are in each of the tribes. It'll go through and say, here's this tribe, and here's how many people were in it, and here's this tribe, and here's how many. So you basically get an accounting for the number of people. Now, that is highly debatable, believe it or not. Some people will look at that pas- those passages of Scripture, and their understanding of the number of Israelites is somewhere in the realm of 30,000. Other people will look at the exact same passage of Scripture and land uh, at a place of somewhere around 2 million. And it all depends on how you translate two very specific words and whether or not those words have been translated properly over time. Now, I'm not going to get into the detail of that. It doesn't make any difference to the things that God wants to reveal to us today. But if you believe there are 2 million Israelites traveling together or 30,000 Israelites traveling together, I I encourage you to go research that more. Theologians uh, disagree on that pretty heavily. But It's not going to change anything we're going to talk about today. So the book of Numbers goes through the numbers of people, all right? Numbers chapters 1 through 12, you're going to see more of the same. The people are constantly complaining, and then the people are, uh, uh, you know, wanting more and more. They're they're wanting to go back. There's all that stuff that kind of continues throughout this this whole series, and essentially, God shows more mercy and chooses not to give up on a very insolent people. So we're all the way now through Numbers 12, and I want to encourage you to grab a copy of God's Word and open up to Numbers 13. Numbers 13 is where we're going to spend our time today. While you are opening up a copy of God's Word and getting to Romans thir- or Numbers 13, by the way, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, we want you to have one. That's really important to us as a church is that each of you are spending time uh, with a steady diet of God's Word on your own outside of Sunday morning. So if you don't have a Bible, just take that one that you just found in front of you and write your name in it and take it home with you. We want you to have that, all right? We'll replace it. We'll make sure the person sitting in your chair next service has a Bible also. Um, But grab that and take it with you, okay? Uh, So while you're turning to Numbers 13... I want to give you a little bit of context about what's happening here before we get to Numbers 13. You see, what's happened now is we're about one year away from the Israelites leaving Egypt. It's been about a year. They, they, went, they went through the Red Sea. They went up on Mount Sinai. They, you know, they got the, the law. They're, they're getting instructions for building a tabernacle. And they've been, essentially, there's a one-year period. And now we've arrived at this place called essentially the promised land. Now, a lot of people, right, you're, they're only one year in, and they've already arrived at what God wants to give them. And I can show you this context. Uh, don't turn there. Stay in Exodus 13, but I'll show you on the screen. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, here's the context for what's happened at this one-year mark. It says, look, this is Moses speaking, he has placed the land in front of you. Go and occupy it, As the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Essentially, what I want to make sure you understand about this context of how this whole storyline goes down is at the very beginning, one year in, the Israelites arrive at the promised land, and God says, there it is. Go in immediately and take it. I have this gift for you. I have this blessing, this promised land, this this thing that's been planned for you. It's yours for the taking. You just now need to go in and claim it. You see, this concept of the spies, a lot of us think that that was God's idea. But if you keep reading the context in Deuteronomy, you realize that God's plan from the very beginning was to take them to the promised land and say, here's the gift I have for you. Go right on in. No spies necessary. 
No due diligence necessary. You see, what we're going to see here is essentially that there are two roots that you get to pick when you come to moments like this in your life. There's going to be a moment in your life, multiple moments in your life, where God has a blessing, a plan, a will for your life, and it's right in front of you. And what he's really saying to you is, go and take it. I have this gift for you. I have this blessing for you. And when you get there, there's going to be two roots you can choose about claiming that blessing. And there's the root of fear, and there's the root of faith. And we're going to explore how there's two different paths and what those milestones are along these two different routes. You're going to see that really clearly in Scripture, that the same is true for us all throughout our life, that God will have a blessing, something right in front of you that he wants you to have, that he's prepared in advance for you, and he wants you to take it, and you get to choose, am I going to go the route of fear, or am I going to go the route of faith? You'll notice in that Deuteronomy passage, remember, it was, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. God, at the very beginning through Moses, is telling people, listen, don't choose the root of fear. And yet, you'll see that they immediately lean. If, if we're at the intersection where fear goes this way and faith goes this way, they haven't chosen a root yet, but they are, they're starting to kind of move towards the intersection that's going to take them down the route of fear. And here's how we see that happen before they even make a choice. If you keep reading in that context, it stay, remember, stay in Numbers 13, but in Deuteronomy 1, the very next verse, remember God says, here's the promised land, go and take it. Look who the, the, the spies, look whose idea this was. It says, but you all came to me and said, first, let's send out scouts to explore the land for us. Don't miss this. God says, go and take it. And they say, oh, let's do some due diligence. First, let's send out scouts to explore the land for us. Then they will advise us on the best route to take and which towns we should enter. And I I got to this passage and kind of asked myself, and I want to ask you to ask yourself this question right now. What blessing does God maybe have right in front of you? What blessings has he placed right in front of you? But you've just been too afraid to claim it. So you decided, you know, I'm going to go the route of fear in receiving this blessing the hard way as opposed to faith and taking what God has given to me now. You see, we often disguise fear under the label of due diligence. I really want to make sure you all understand what this means. When I say we often disguise fear under the label of due diligence, I'm not knocking due diligence. There are plenty of times in life where God has given you wisdom. He's given you advisors. He's given you research. He's given you things that some due diligence is often necessary. But what I see happen far too often in the life of believers is God is clearly calling them to take a step of faith. And yet they they hide behind this label of saying, "Mm, the timing's not right, The, the finances aren't right, this isn't right, that's not right. And they can just push off what God is giving them right in front of them because they're afraid to take it and claim it. So you have the Israelites, right? They're they have the promise right in front of them. They haven't chosen fear or faith yet, but boy, are they kind of leaning in one direction. You see, what happens next, because you actually, if you keep reading in Deuteronomy, you see that God is described as a good father. It actually says that he's a, just as a father cares for his child. And what we see is that God is going to remain patient with his people. A good illustration for this is when when your kids are young, right, and you're putting them to bed, Oftentimes, young children are afraid of the dark, right? Now, we know as parents, there's not actually a monster under the bed. We know there's not actually a monster in the closet. We know there's not actually anything in that room that they need to be afraid of. And what we could just say is, you know what? I know you want light. I know that you're afraid. But there's nothing in here that you need to be afraid of. So you just need to trust me. No light for you. 
But what we usually do as good parents is we recognize that trust and faith and things, these are things that take time. You've got to build them. And what we'll do is we'll put in a little, we'll put in a little nightlight as, a, as an act of love. And that's exactly what God does right here. The people are looking at the promise that God has given to them, and they're starting to lean into fear. And God says, listen, all right, if you want to send scouts into the land, listen, the promise is yours. You can just go in and take it. But if you want to send scouts into the land and see what you're dealing with first, fine. He blesses this idea. And that's where we end up in Numbers 13. See, the people... When they complained and begged for food, God gave it. When they complained and begged for meat, God gave them quail. When they said they were thirsty, we haven't got there yet, but God's going to bring water out of a rock. God is a good father who kind of recognizes when you're leaning into fear and will, will do the best he can to, to lovingly help and guide and build up your, your, your faith in those moments of fear. So God permits their weariness and lets them go see the land for themselves and that's essentially where we find ourselves. In Numbers 13, uh, verses 1 through 3, you see essentially that God says, why don't you pick out 12 spies, one from each tribe, and send them into the land? Uh, he gives them what they're asking for. They're still leaning into fear, but they haven't chosen one route or the other yet. They haven't decided to go the path of faith. They haven't decided to go to the path of fear Moses tells them, go in and explore the land, examine the people, bring back some samples of the crops. We want to know what we're dealing with here. And then we get to, to Numbers 13, verse 21, is where the spies have now returned from their journey. They were 40 days in the promised land. They've now come back with samples of the crops and a, a report and it says in, in verse uh, 21, actually this is before, it says, so they went and explored the land from the wilderness. When they came to the valley of Eskel, or Eshel, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of the pomegranates and figs. And it says they, after 40 days, through verse 26, it says they were there for 40 days and they come back. And here's the report they give in verse 27. This was their report to Moses. First of all, before I get into this, everyone following along, all right? God's given them a promise. He said, go ahead and take it. They say, we want, we want to send spies in first. He says, fine. 40 days, they go in, they look, they grab some stuff, they come back, and now they're making a report. And here's what they say. We entered the land you sent us to explore. I love that. Oh, we went into the land, Moses, that you thought was a good idea for us to go check out. It was their idea. And it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. There is the kind, uh, here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak, and the Amalekites that live in the Negev, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites that live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. So you see that they come back now with this report. And at first, the report sounds really promising. They said, it's an incredible land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, a bountiful land. Remember, they're even coming back with this big old thing of grapes between two of them on a pole just to kind of show how great this land is, how bountiful it is. But you're going to notice that they do something about halfway through the report. And instead of using the word and, they use the word but. They go through the report, it's good, it's good, it's good, but. And then they change their tone. You see, the report is all really good considering on how you choose to hear it, which route you decide to take. If you decide to take the route of faith, you're going to hear that report one way. And if you decide to take the route of fear, you're going to hear that report another way. You see, when you use the word but instead of and, what you're doing is instead of just presenting the facts, you're taking the facts and you're presenting now a, a conclusion. Far gone conclusion. Here's the problem. We can't do it. You see, fear will draw conclusions based on feelings instead of faith. Fear has this incredible power to just give you the conclusion 
instead of allowing you to make decisions based on faith. So they give this report, and then Caleb, one of the, uh, of all the spies, I want you to hear this. There's, there's two spies that give a kind of a different report, and the 10 spies that give the report you just heard, and Caleb is one of the two. And this is what he says in Numbers 13, verse 30. It says, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. He said, let's go at once to take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it. I hope you see the difference of these two reports. 12 spies go into the land. 12 spies come back 40 days later. 10 of them give the report that says, but we certainly, there's, there's giants and they're, they're, they're big and they're powerful. And, and then two of them, Caleb and Joshua, they say, we can certainly take this land. Let's go and take it at once. So what I want to show you is that when you choose between these two, right, you have 12 spies, one mission, and two different reports. You have 10 that choose the root of fear, and you have two that choose the root of faith. You have the trusting two versus the terrified 10. Two that see a promise, 10 that see a problem, two that see their destiny, and 10 that see their defeat. Two very specific very clear different routes that you can take. And what I want to show you is that when you pick one route versus the other, you're going to see that there's certain milestones along your route that help you know which route you're on. There might be a decision right now you're trying to make in your life, and you're not sure, am I actually on the route of fear or am I on the route of faith? And you'll notice some of these milestones that will help you kind of, these little placards on the road, That'll tell you which route you're on. And here's the first one we notice in this, in this account. The first milestone is if you're on the route of fear, is this thing we call an inferiority complex. But if you go the route of faith, you're going to see that you have this confidence. There's these two different things on both of these routes. Uh, the inferiority complex you're going to see in just a moment, but you can certainly see Caleb is a man of confidence. What does he say? Remember, he says, we can certainly conquer it. Man, that is a man of confidence. He starts from a place, he immediately picks the root of faith, and he stands right at the milestone and says, we can take this land. But you already heard how all the other 10 spies decided to walk. They decided to go the root of the inferiority complex. Here's what they say verses 31 and a little last part of 33. It says, But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. See if you hear any confidence in any of this, all right? We cannot go up against them. They are stronger than we are. And then he says this in verse 33. Uh, the spies say, we, Next to them we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. What an incredible example of an inferiority complex. To to just go in and and see the promise God has for you and to go and explore and see it for yourself and to come out of that experience saying, we certainly cannot take that. In fact, next to what is over there, we feel like grasshoppers. That's how small the people on the other side made us feel. This inferiority complex is an incredibly dangerous thing. Have you ever been to a, a carnival or a fair, or some place that had like a, 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 a mirror fun house, where you go in and there's like a mirror maze, and there's different mirrors. And one of the things you'll notice when you go into a mirror fun house, right, there's different mirrors that will make you look, you can tell that it's you, but the way the mirror's been designed, it kind of messes with your reflection a little bit, right? You might stand in front of one mirror and see that you look like you have been working out your top side like way overdone and you've skipped leg day for quite a long time, right? Maybe you look at another mirror and it makes your whole body look like a big pear. Maybe another one over here and you look like this little hobbit with a huge head or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, you look, I don't know. But here's my point. All of those mirrors are showing a reflection of you, but they're not showing the true reflection of you. They're not showing who you actually are. And what happens when you choose the root of fear, you choose to see this messed up reflection of who God claims that you are. It makes you smaller than you really are. 
because you have this inferiority complex instead of standing confidently in who God says that you are. And that's what happens here in this, this issue. There's this thing that you'll, you'll hear about as you read Scripture and really even talk about in just normal psychology called the, the Egypt mentality. I want you to think about this for a moment. The Israelites had been living under oppression in Egypt, if you remember this, for 400 years. And that sounds like a long time, but just to put that into perspective, the United States of America is not yet 250 years old. The country you live in is not yet 250 years old. The, the Israelites lived under oppression in Egypt for 400 years. And this Egypt mentality has caused them to constantly see themselves as lesser than, as weaker than, as inferior. They have this mentality of defeat and discouragement and destitution. And we see them lean into this Egypt mentality over and over again where they don't think they even deserve the promise that God has in front of them. But here's the, the thing I want you to, a little another call out, is faith does not minimize reality. Faith recognizes that God is bigger than your reality. You see, when the, the spies went in and they saw giants, the giants were probably real. These giant, huge people, they probably really were giant and huge. Faith doesn't mean that you have to make the reality that you see with your eyes smaller. It just means that you take a step of, in your step of faith, you recognize that your God is bigger than all of that reality that you see in front of you. So you can either make yourself smaller or you can trust that God is bigger. That's this, the, the, these two roots. The first milestone is this inferiority complex or confidence. And the second milestone you're gonna, you're gonna see as you either go this route, this route of fear or faith, is this negative spirit versus a positive spirit. One of the reasons I bring up this negative spirit versus a positive spirit is the Bible actually brings this up. In Numbers 14, it actually says that Caleb and Joshua, the two that, that gave the good report, it says this, it says that they had a different spirit. It's pretty powerful that they, they approach this whole thing from a different place and a different spirit. There's a, a story about a, a CEO of a shoe company during the Industrial Revolution. This guy, he owned a shoe company, and his, his company was successful here in the States during the Industrial Revolution, and he had figured out these processes for mass-producing shoes, and he, he decides he wants to consider expanding this shoe empire into the lesser developed world. So he sends out two scouts. He says, listen, I want you to go over here and explore this undeveloped region of the world and see whether or not we should expand our shoe business over there. And I want to send you over here and I want you to explore and then report back whether or not we should expand our shoe business over there. And after they've gone out and they've explored, they send a telegraph back to the owner of the shoe company. And one of them their telegram says, research done. Do not send shoes. No one wears shoes. <laughs> and then he goes and he gets the other telegram and he gets this, research done. Send every pair you have. No one wears shoes. Like two People that experience the exact same thing, and there's this positive spirit, and there's a negative spirit. There's the seeing kind of the half, half glass half empty or the glass half full, right? It's, it's this perspective on how you see what God has placed in front of you. And it says that Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit. Have you ever worked with someone who just had a negative spirit? I, I worked with someone who, before a meeting even started, they could walk into the room and destroy the entire meeting. Like that no one had even spoken a word yet, and we knew the, the, the way that meeting was going to go. Because they just brought a negative spirit into the space everywhere they went. 
And you know, that kind of leads us to the next milestone. What, what, does, um, what does a negative spirit love more than anything else? Misery loves what? Company. Man, if you've got a negative spirit or you've got a positive spirit, one of the things you're going to see is that there's this, this next milestone is one of, of a type of recruitment. So the next milestone, if you're on the route of fear, you're going to notice that there's this peer pressure, this phase that you're going to go through. And in faith, you're going to see this peer influence. One takes you down this road of negative peer pressure and the other one towards positive peer influence. You know, one of the things that's true about humankind, just the way we work, is that we like to be right. We like that the way we see the world, we want other people to see the world the exact same way we do. When we're in a bad mood, we want other people to be in a bad mood. When we're in a great mood, we want other people to be in a great mood. For whatever reason, we like this, it's almost this thing called confirmation bias, right? However you're feeling about whatever it is that you're feeling about, you want other people to, to meet you there so you can confirm that you're right. You want to look for answers wherever you can find them to confirm what you believe to be true. And oftentimes what we do is we recruit other people. And that's what happens here. In Numbers 13, verse 32, here's what the, the, the ten spies did. It says, so they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. They're saying, listen, we don't feel good about this, and we don't want you to feel good about this. So they spread a bad report saying, if you go there, you're going to die. Meanwhile, the other two are on the root of faith, and this is what Joshua and Caleb say in verse, uh, chapter 14, verses 7 through 8. It says, they said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through, uh, by the way, I don't want you to miss this. If we go back uh, to that last passage real fast, I want to show you something. Uh, notice what it says. Uh, they, they were spread their support. The land we traveled through and explored, dot, dot, dot. They give this report, right? Now let's go to the next one, right? So now Caleb and Joshua in, in chapter 14, here's what they say. Let's go to the next slide. It says, ready? And here's their report. It says, uh, the land we traveled through and explored. It's like they take the exact same wording and says, hey, that report of negativity that they just brought to you to try to recruit you onto their side, oh, we got a positive spirit. And we're gonna take that exact same report, we're gonna put a big old line through the second half of that, and we're gonna give you the right report. And here's what they say. The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. It is, and if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Yeah, I'm reminded of a game that many of us probably played when we were children in some capacity, right? You just find a big pile of dirt somewhere and you can play king of the hill. One thing you'll notice when you play king of the hill, in fact, one of the best ways to really see this and this isn't a safe way to play this game, so don't do this. But if you were standing on a table, would it be easier to get someone off of that table from the ground? Or would it be easier to get someone up onto that table from up on the table? See, clearly it's easier to get someone off of the hill. It's easier to push someone off of the table than it is to lift someone onto the table with you. It is so much easier with a negative spirit to recruit people to negative thinking than it is for that one positive guy to encourage other people towards positive peer influence. And you see their negativity worked. In Numbers 14, it says, the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. The 10 spies spread this false report, and everybody starts crying. We came all this way, and now we can't go any further because we're going to die if we do. So as we're on these two routes, the root of fear and the root of faith, the next stop you're going to see is on the root of fear, you're going to get to a place called rebellion. And on the root of faith, you're going to get to a place called obedience. You're going to either find yourself rebelling against what God has in front of you, or you're going to obey and take that step that God is calling you into. And we can see that as we keep reading in Numbers 14, we see more complaining. Here's the rebelling. It says, Would, wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt than be 
uh, then, uh, at, then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to the oppression we were under for 400 years. Wouldn't it be better for us to be living under oppression? Let's recruit some, someone new who wants to take us backwards. And then Caleb and Joshua, right, they're on the other route. Here's what they say in verse 9. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with them, or with us. Don't be afraid of them. There's such a huge difference between choosing the path of rebellion that leads to rebellion and the, the path that leads to obedience. Caleb and Joshua are saying, we're at this place. We've got a, a positive spirit in us, right? We're choosing this, this, this to, to, to try to encourage other people with positive peer influence. And now we're at this place. We're ready to obey God and take the promise that he has for us. And yet the other 10 have been successful in bringing everyone down to a place of rebellion where they actually want to go backwards from where God is telling them to go forwards. Here's how that that works out in Numbers 14, verses 10 and 11. It says, but the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? Even after all the miraculous signs I have done amongst them. You know that, that, that uh, nightlight you might put up for your child when they're three? You're, I think you're, you're hoping that at some point they can grow and mature to a place where on their own they know there are no monsters living under their bed. You hope they grow in their faith and their trust to a place where, listen, has a monster ever climbed out and grabbed you? No, we don't need this anymore. And God is saying, listen, after all you've seen, after all the, the miracles I've, I've performed in front of you, after everything I've done, how in the world, Moses, how long am I supposed to be patient with these people? He's having this conversation, this whole community, it's just talking about stoning Joshua and Caleb. And God says, how long will these people treat me with contempt? I want you to understand that we do this exact same thing in our day-to-day -day decisions. Here's a really good example I bet you all know somebody, those of you who are followers of Jesus, I bet you know somebody that you know is far from Jesus. Someone that you would love it if they would give their life to Christ. And here's how we, we approach situations like that. Some of us, we see someone who needs the love of Jesus and we think to ourselves, you know, this person loves their lifestyle of sin. They really seem like they're, they have no desire to have anything to do with faith. Every time it comes up, they kind of mock it. This person, this person uh, might, might need Jesus, but they certainly would reject it, so I'm just not going to share Jesus with them. They're, they're, they're fine. Or this person seems to hate the things of Jesus. This seem, person seems to love their life of sin. This person seems to really, this person, if anybody, I should be telling that person about Jesus. You see, we do the exact same thing. We have an opportunity in front of us, and we get to choose in that opportunity. Are we going to go the route of fear or the route of faith? Are we going to be obedient to what God's asking us to do, or are we going to rebel Are you rebelling against God's calling on your life because of fear? Or are you obeying because of faith? And then we get to this kind of last milestone on these two different routes. On the route of fear, you're going to arrive at this place of punishment. And on the route of faith, you're going to arrive at a place of reward. And it says, as the people chose rebellion, then came punishment. So let me show you how this punishment went down. In Numbers 14, verse 12, it says, I will disown them. This is what God wants to do. I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. But Moses objected. Moses pleads with God, as you keep reading, for additional mercy. He says, God, will you please continue to show these people? I know they're insolent. I know they're, they're, they're ridiculous. I know they keep choosing fear over faith. But will you give them another chance? 
This is what he says in verse 19. He says, in keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of this people, just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. I love how Moses goes into this. You notice he says, in keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love. Do you know how I know my kids are about to ask for something? They walk and say, Dad, man, you look good today. Have I ever told you how amazing you are? And what would we say as a parent? What do you want? <laughs> Moses walks in and says, God, you are loving. You are magnificent. Would you please just forgive these people one more time? And trust me, God is going to forgive them far more than one more time. And this is what the Lord says in verse 20. And the Lord said, I will pardon them as you have requested. But as surely as I live... Now, that's, uh, that's a guaranteed promise right there. As surely as I live, and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter the land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. They will never even see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. And he goes on in verse 29. He says, you will all drop dead in this wilderness. And if you, if you look at the context of that, he's saying that anyone who's 20 years of age or older, the ones who are ultimately responsible for choosing this route of fear over this route of faith, are not going to be able to, to follow and, and go into the promised land. But you'll notice there's an exception. Caleb and Joshua will get to experience the promised land. And then we get to that place. Remember we call this whole series the wander years? Look at this punishment. In Numbers 14, verse 25, don't, I don't want you to miss the importance of this. They're standing at the promised land. They're standing at what God was going to give them. And then he says this. Now turn around. And don't go on towards the land where the Amalekites and the Canaanites live. Tomorrow you must set out for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. In verse 34, it says, Because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sin. Can you imagine this, this punishment? That there might be a promise a promised land, a blessing that God has right in front of you, and he's telling you to claim it, to grab it. I'm bigger than the reality that you see. I'm, I'm bigger. And we choose often the root of fear, and we find ourselves, in some cases, the punishment is that we never, ever receive the blessing that God had in front of us to claim. Oh, I can't even imagine. One thing I really want to make sure we all, all recognize before I wrap up this morning is notice the people said that they would rather, if you go back and, and read it for yourself, I don't have the exact reference. They say, we'd rather die in the wilderness than go into that land. And do you know what God says? Fine. You'd rather die in the wilderness than to go into that land I'm going to give you what you want. Don't miss the, the parallel of this to the way the offer of, 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 of eternal life through salvation works. There are many people in this world and in this room who are going to say, God, I choose to not live in relationship with you. And one day, you're going to be standing before God and he's going to say, fine, your choice. You made a choice. 
If you don't want to be in a relationship with God, listen to this, church. If you don't want to live in a relationship with God, he is going to give you what you want. And out of love for you, he lets you decide, do you want to live in relationship with me? Do you want the, the, the covering of my, my son's blood on a cross to cover for your sin and to atone for your sin, or do you want to go about it on your own? You decide, but he's going to love you enough to give you what you want. He's not going to force anybody into a relationship with him. Have any of you been on a road trip recently with young kids? You know the phrase, are we there yet? And I can imagine that over these next 40 years, this was a phrase that came up over and over again, are we there yet? Are we there yet? As they're wandering around when they were already standing at the final destination of blessing. Numbers 14, verse 36 Here's a specific punishment for those 10 guys, all right? It says, The 10 men Moses had sent to explore the land, the ones who incited rebellion against the Lord with their bad report, were struck dead with a plague before the Lord. Of the 12 who had explored the land, only Joshua and Caleb remained alive. And then we get from Numbers 15 through 36. In Deuteronomy 1 through 30, and essentially what you're going to see as you read those large chunks of Scripture is a lot of complaining, a lot of rebelling, and a lot of forgiving over and over and over again. You're going to see incredible punishment balanced with incredible mercy as God has his people wandering in the wilderness. And as God continues to bless his people even in the midst of their rebellion, so we get to this point where we ask this question, what now, God? What do we do with this? I hope at this point every Sunday as a church family, we can all ask this question, God, what do you want me to do with this information? What can you and I do right now in light of this truth? I want to ask you a, a, a quick Bible quiz question, all right? You ready for this? Have you ever heard of these Bible characters? Shemao, Shaphat, Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Gadi, Emiel, Sether, Nabi, and Guelel. Have you ever heard of these 10 Bible characters? Those are the 10 spies that rejected the promise of God. Never heard of them. Their names are mentioned in here, but nobody here names their kid. We name our kids Joshua. We name our kids Caleb. We know those names. You know the name Caleb actually has a really cool meaning in Hebrew. The, the name Caleb means wholeheartedly. How amazing would it be to be a church where we recognize that when God calls us to a blessing or calls us into a promise, we can say, God, we're going to be a church that instead of choosing the root of fear, we're going to choose the root of faith, and we're going to do it wholeheartedly. We're going to step into it. We're going to walk right into what God has planned for us. And there have been so many instances in, I have three daughters, right? There's been many instances where I'm trying to teach my, my girls how to take giant steps of faith. And one of the best ways to do that is at the edge of a pool, right? Before they've learned how to swim or maybe they're their first time off a diving board and they're standing on the edge and I'm already in the pool ready to catch them. And I'm saying, listen, just jump in. I'm going to catch you. And oftentimes you find those, those moments of fear just so overwhelming that nobody jumps in. And as they develop their, their faith, as they develop their trust in me, their father, eventually they get to a point where they're willing to jump in. I mean, there's nothing more wholehearted than jumping into a pool when you don't know how to swim. Jump in wholeheartedly, trusting and knowing that I'm going to catch them. I'm going to close with a passage of scripture from the New Testament. I'm going to read it and then I'm going to pray. And this passage from Hebrews chapter 3 is in reference to these spies in this moment at the promised land. It says in Hebrews 3, 7, it says, that is why the Holy Spirit says, today when you hear his voice, 
Don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled and when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them. And I said, their hearts are always turned away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure, here's, here's your what now, God. You ready for it? Be careful, brothers and sisters. Here it is. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and not unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, you will share in all that belongs to Christ. If you trust God and go the root of faith, you will one day experience the promised land of eternity. And it goes on in chapter four, the next two verses, it says God's promise of entering his rest, listen to this, still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news, that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. That's good stuff. Hey, my wife and I, we had an opportunity this past week to have dinner at a, a family's house that's part of this church. And I heard a phrase as I was having dinner. It was a pastor who always ended a sermon with a certain line. And I, I don't plan to end every Sunday this way, but man, I want to end it today. And here it is. You ready? Now you know. Now you're accountable. Let's pray. Father, thank you for making it really clear that this isn't just an account of the Israelite people standing before the promised land so many years ago. This is a reminder to each of us that you're calling us into a forever relationship with you. You're calling us into your promised land. And on this path, on this life that we live, we have opportunities to step into your blessing in faith or to go the, the route of fear. And for many of us, unfortunately, throughout this globe, people will choose the route that doesn't lead to a forever promised blessing that you, you offer to them. God, I ask that this wouldn't be a church that allows that to happen, that we'd be a church that's constantly pointing people to you in faith, that we're asking people to take steps of faith. God, that if there's anybody in this room who has never decided to trust you and put their life in your hands, that they would make that decision today, that today would be the day they get off of that root of fear and step onto that root of faith and decide they're gonna trust you wholeheartedly in whatever blessings you have in front of them for this life and for the eternal life to come. God, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.